To ensure an internally and externally equitable pay structure and set of pay policies, a market pay line is really important. And it can be used as a tool in order to ensure both the internal alignment and the external competitiveness of our pay practices within our organizations. So the goal is to integrate internal and external equity. And what that means is that our goal is to establish a pay structure with high internal equity, which is sometimes referred to as internal alignment, and with high external equity, which is sometimes referred to as external competitiveness, with the purpose to compensate fairly within the organization and competitively with respect to other organizations. So again, our goal is this alignment between the internal structure, our job structure within the organization, and that we're paying jobs that are worth more to the organization more accordingly, and that with respect to other organizations and competitors in our industry, that we are also paying jobs competitively in that regard. Now, a market pay line is a tool that we can use to help with this integration between internal and external equity. So a market pay line refers to the relationship between the internal job structure of the organization for benchmark jobs and the external pay practices of other organizations. Now, there's two real components of a market pay line, and really we're just talking about two different variables here, a predictor variable and an outcome variable. Now, in the context of a market pay line, the predictor variable is something that's going to indicate the job structure. So this could be job evaluation points from a point factor or point um, factor method or system approach. It could also be job classifications or job grades. However, it is that you've determined the relative worth of different jobs within your organization and created a job structure. So the job structure represents the relative worth of different jobs based on compensable factors. So compensable factors includes things perhaps like the education required for that job, the skill level, the amount of expertise, and things like that. Whatever it is that your job or that your organization determines are worthwhile to the organization and hold value. And then you can evaluate each benchmark job or core job using those different um, compensable factors and however you've scaled and weighted them. Now, a job structure is also established using some type of job evaluation approach, which is that approach where we identify those comp compensable factors and then determine how much is each job worth in our organization relative to others. So again, as I mentioned earlier, we can use approaches like the point factor method, which is sometimes called the point factor system, classification methods, or just more simple ranking methods to determine the job structure of the organization, whether that ends up in point values for each specific job, which would be consistent with the point factor method, or it means putting jobs into different job grades. So jobs with similar words are put into a certain grade, and then perhaps you have numerical um, or some type of ordinal variable that describes that structure of different job grades within your organization. Now, job structures are also or should be created independently of market pay information. So ideally, you're looking internally within your organization and saying, how much is each job or each job grade worth to our organization, regardless of how much another organization or competitors might be paying for that? And then with our job structure, this is going to result in different jobs being assigned different points or to different job grades, depending on the different approach that you might have used as part of job evaluation. Now, the second variable is going to be the outcome variable, which in this case is going to correspond to external pay rates or, in other words, market pay rates. Now, these are going to be determined by using some type of market review process and typically market salary surveys or simply just market surveys as these are useful tools for determining how much are our competitors or other organizations that are similar to us paying similar or the same jobs, which we would often call our benchmark jobs or those jobs that are key jobs or common jobs within the industry or across industries. Now, the external pay rates as our outcome variable are going to be estimated or should be estimated independently of the job structure information. And this is usually easier to do because you are looking at these external market reviewers, market survey sources. Now, the external pay rates or market rates, these are going to result in pay rates for benchmark jobs. 
Okay, so you're not gonna find every job or it's unlikely that you'll find every single job has a match in your market review or using these market surveys. Instead, you identify those jobs again that they're key jobs or benchmark jobs that are gonna be common across the industry. And then you can identify those pay rates such as the median pay rate, the 25th percentile, the pay rate, the 75th percentile and so forth to get an idea of the amount of variation there. Now, when it comes to estimating a market pay line, there's different approaches we can use. And typically, a regression-based approach is going to be used. So I'll do a quick review of how simple linear regression would be used and when it would be appropriate, as well as when polynomial regression approaches or logarithmic transformation regression approaches would be appropriate. So technically, because these latter two approaches, the polynomial regression approach and the logarithmic transformation regression approach, because they're used for nonlinear association, associations or modeling or estimating nonlinear associations between the two variables. So technically, these aren't going to result in a line because a line refers to, well, a line, something that's straight. Now, a curve is a more inclusive description of which a live line is a specific type of curve, but a curve could also include nonlinear associations. So technically, what we're estimating with these polynomial regression and logarithmic transformation regression models is going to be a market pay curve. Now, let's assume this situation where we look at our scatter plot here. We're trying to understand the nature of the relationship between, let's say, job evaluation points or job grades and the market pay rates that we've identified. So as you can see here, we have this plot. And in the plot, you can start to visualize that likely this is a linear association here. Okay, So a line would best fit these data most likely. Well, if this is the case, a simple linear regression model would be appropriate. And so this is going to be used when there is a single predictor variable, such as job evaluation points, and a single outcome variable, such as market pay rates, and when you suspect that there is a linear association between these two variables. So as you can see here, we do, if we were to model this using a line here, this would be your typical line of best fit. And so here, this would be a linear association. And we use that typical uh, equation for a line, which would be our outcome variable, which we, here is y, or market pay rates, is going to be equal to the intercept, which is where this line crosses the y-axis, when the x variable, which in this case is points or job grades, is equal to 0. And then that's going to be the b sub 0 regression coefficient here. And the b sub 1 regression coefficient is going to refer to the slope here, so the rise over the run of this line that we see here. And now, you would typically expect with a market pay line that it's going to have, in general, an upward trajectory as opposed to a downward trajectory. You would expect that jobs that are worth more are going to be paid more. Now, x in this equation refers to points and grades. So now we're going to move on to nonlinear approaches to modeling the association between job points or grades in relation to market pay rates. And so we're going to use the same equation that we see here, the formula for a line as a starting point, but we're going to be adapting it using other approaches. So now let's take a look at this scatter plot here. And as you can see, there see, appears to be a pretty clear curvature to this. So this appears to be nonlinear. A line would probably not fit these data very well. We're looking at this association between job evaluation points and or grades in relation to market pay rates. And so in this case, one approach we could use would be polynomial regression. And so when you hear polynomial reg regression, just think about exponents. Think about adding terms or exponents such as squared or cubes in order to model curvilinear or nonlinear associations between two variables. So again, we're using just a single predictor variable here, which is going to be, let's say, job evaluation points, and a single outcome variable, which is going to be our market pay rates. However, we suspect that there's a nonlinear functional form. And in this case, we assume that there's a quadratic functional form here, or in other words, there's an exponential growth, or that there's just a single bend here. And so let's say that we model this and we find that, well, actually a quadratic polynomial regression model fits the data pretty well here. And as you can see, this red line represents that polynomial regression equation. And here's that equation written out here. So this is a quadratic equation because we see just a single bend here. And so again, y is our outcome variable, which is our market pay rates here. 
and then x is going to refer to the points or the grades that we have here, and that's our predictor variable. And b sub zero is again our intercept value. b sub one is gonna be the linear component of this, but b sub two is gonna to refer to the quadratic or the squared component of this model here. So that's where that curvature comes in. And so here you see the squared, the exponent squared here, which indicates that this is a quadratic functional form here, assuming that this regression coefficient associated with this is statistically significantly different from zero. So now let's look at another nonlinear association that we might come across. And here you can see that, wow, there's not just one bend, but there's maybe two bends here in this functional form. And so we could again use polynomial regression here because again, we have just a single predictor variable. So the job points or grades in relation to market pay as the single outcome variable. But we do suspect that there's a nonlinear form here. And this appears to be a cubic form, meaning that there's two bends here. So let's say that we model a line of best fit here. And this, it would be an example of a cubic functional form. So here's bend number one, here's bend number two right here. And so again, y is our market pay rate here. b sub zero is the intercept value. b sub one is the linear component. b sub two is the quadratic component. And then we have this new term here, which is b sub three. And here we have our predictor variable or x cubed. And so this is where that extra bend comes in. And this is where the cubic functional form comes in here. So you can see this was just built on top of the well, first the linear model that we saw, the simple linear regression model, and then the quadratic model, and then now we're at the cubic model here. So there's other ways that we can model nonlinear associations in addition to using or besides using polynomial regression. We can also use what are called logarithmic transformation regressions. And so this is going to look a, pretty similar to the simple regression models that we use in terms of how it's written out, but it can be used to help capture some of this curvature here. So again, we have a single predictor variable, we have a single outcome variable, but we do suspect there's a nonlinear association between the predictor and the outcome variable. So here we see, again, we would expect this to be that exponential growth or quadratic form here. So before we saw we could model this using a polynomial regression model. However, we could also use an exponential model that is based on a logarithmic transformation of our outcome variable, which is our market pay variable here. So if we do a log transformation of our outcome variable of market pay and set that as the outcome and then use a standard right side of the equation for our simple linear regression model where we have our intercept value, which is b sub zero, and our slope value, which would be b sub one, and x again equals the predictor variable of points or grades in this case, this would be one way to capture that nonlinearity here of the association between these two variables. Now, here's another type of logarithmic transformation regression that let's say you want to capture this type of functional form here, where this might be called your more classic logarithmic transformation here, where we do see a single bend and we see this kind of exponential increase and then this asymptote and this deceleration of the association here. So you can envision that relationship between our predictor variable and our outcome variable here. And so we might call this just simply a logarithmic model here. And the way that the way this is different from the last model, which was our exponential model, that is that instead of the outcome variable or y being taking the log of that, we're taking the log or the logarithmic transformation of our predictor variable, which is x here. So that's the difference here. And so this would be another way that you can model this. Now, this is just a brief summary. We've talked about different ways. If you want to model a line, use simple linear regression in this context. If you want to model um, curvature or nonlinear associations, then you're going to want to use something like polynomial regression or logarithmic transformation regression. Now, often when it comes to nonlinear associations, more than one approach can be used to effectively capture or model the association between two variables. So as you saw, uh, we could use a quadratic polynomial regression model or that exponential logarithmic transformation regression model and both to capture. And really it's up to you to decide which one is going to be more appropriate. Um, I tend to prefer working with polynomial regression models, but it really depends on what specifically you're trying to model and what you're most uncomfortable interpreting. So here's an example of a market pay line um, that 
this is from a hypothetical set of jobs here. Let's say it's from the job family of nurse. And so here we have a CNA, which would be a certified nursing assistant. We have an LPN, licensed practical nurse, RN, registered nurse, CN, charge nurse, MP, nurse practitioner, NM would be nurse manager. And then we have ND, which let's say means nursing director here. And so here we can see we use the point factor method here. We have the job evaluation points on the x-axis. We have the, in this case, it's the monthly base pay in US dollars here on the y-axis. And each one of these blue diamonds represents the actual values. And here's our line of best fit from a simple linear regression model. And just like any simple linear regression model, and the same would go for a polynomial regression model or a logarithmic transformation model, we can use our R squared value as an indicator of variance explained by our predictor variable in our outcome variable, which is also an indicator of model fit. And so here you can see, this is a very small model here in terms of the sample size. We just have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different cases, where in this case, each case represents a job. And you can see here though, that the line closely fits the data here, and we see very little residual error. So this would probably fit the data very well, a very high R squared value. So using our market pay line, then we can take potentially the next step if you'd like, and that is to create a pay policy line, where a pay policy line portrays an organization's oper operationalization of its market pay line, thereby representing how an organization translates information about its internal job structure and external pay rates into actionable pay practices. So this is where pay strategy comes into play. This is where you think about your market pay strategy in terms of, are we gonna lead the market, lag the market, or meet the market? for this job or that job and maybe taking a, um, a mixed pay approach and or a mixed market approach in which we lead for some, lag for others, and meet the market for still others. Now, from our pay policy line, we could use this to create pay grades, where a pay grade refers to a group of jobs with similar job evaluation point values or are of the same job grade that are then assigned common pay midpoint, minimum, and maximum values. So let's take a look at an example of this using that same nursing family of jobs that we just saw a moment ago with that market pay line. So here's an example of a pay policy line here and pay grades used from that pay policy line. So we see the same jobs down here, the same nursing jobs from the nursing job family. And now we have these five pay grades, which means that we took those seven jobs here and we collapsed a couple of them into the same pay grade. So perhaps we noted that the comparable worth of a registered nurse and a charge nurse is about the same in this organization. And so therefore we collapse them into a single pay grade. And the same, let's say, goes for the nurse practitioner, nurse manager. They're collapsed into this same pay grade, which is pay grade D. And as you can see, the pay policy line here represents, it helps us identify the midpoint of each one of these grades. And we can also determine the range spread as well in terms of what's our minimum or maximum value going to be, or minimum or maximum pay going to be for each one of these pay grades here. And then we can use different types of um, pay determinants or decision-making tools like performance, experience, time and grade, and so forth to determine how much we're going to make for job offers for people entering into these jobs and how much we're going to offer in terms of uh, merit-based pay increases and things like that, or if there's any type of variable pay or bonuses that are associated with any of these jobs. So this wraps up the lecture on market pay lines. Again, these are a re really useful tool for ultimately building, building your pay policy line and potentially pay grades, but also for more simply put, just integrating concepts and principles of internal equity. So how fairly we, we structure jobs within our organization with respect to comparable, comparable value or worth and integrating that with our external competitiveness. So how well are we paying people in jobs for key jobs within our organization relative to how competitors are paying for the same or similar jobs in their own organizations? This, this is going to be consequential for our ability to both attract people and to retain people. And also this can be a useful tool for motivating people within their jobs and for motivating people to climb the organizational structure or ladder. So this wraps up that lecture on market pay line.